going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's the one and only James Williams, Dark Waters. You are listening to the Dark Waters Show, which I always say this. We need to come up with a name for it. So if you're hearing this again, say Dark Waters. Stop being retarded and come up with a name. And we need to figure out a name for this, right? Like, like the only reason why I don't officially have a podcast out there because I have more than enough interviews is because my crazy behind hasn't figured out a name. So if you're listening, make some suggestions for names. We're going to put them in a poll, and then we're going to choose the name, and then, you know, we'll launch the official podcast out on all the platforms um, and make it happen. But with that being said, you are hanging out with me right now, and uh, we are talking to Kyle DeShane, and we're going to get into uh, some Bigfoot. And this is the month of February. This whole month, legit, is about to be dedicated to Bigfoot, mainly because I'm tired of Dog Man. I know y'all get tired of me saying I'm tired of Dog Man, but I am tired of Dog Man. And so I kind of want to talk about the Bigfoots. You know what I'm saying? The Bigfoots have been around here for a long time. And if anybody's been with me for a long time, you know the Bigfoots in West Wego, Louisiana, love French bread, butter, lightly buttered, a little bit of toast. And, and it is what it is. So we're going to talk about the Bigfoots. Kyle, how are you doing this evening, my friend? No, I'm not doing too bad. How's, how about yourself? I'm doing fantastic, man. You know, I, I was going to the library to do some work. And... Um, I got over to the library on the college campus, got out the car, walked in, and I looked around. I was like, it's way too many distractions here. I mean, it was, it was, I was like, I'm about to leave. So I got in the car and came back home and got back to work. Um, so talk to me a little bit about your experience in the world of cryptids and Bigfoot. Was this something you found yourself fascinated with as a young man, as a child, or is this something that you had an avid fascination with as you became an adult. How did you get over into this little corner of the world that I call cryptids? Well, at first it was, you know, obviously Monster Quest and, uh, you know, those type of shows that came out on like History Channel and whatnot. And then, you know, as I kind of grew up a little bit longer into my adolescent years, I found the books in the library and, you know, did my book reports and stuff like that on it. So I was always involved in it. I never thought I'd get to the point where I am now where I'm working with, with you know, you know top-of-the-line people and PhDs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but other than that, yeah, I was, I was in, interested. Um, I can't say that I was out there looking for them when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old. But, um, and then uh, it kind of faded out for a while. And then I had my first encounter with one uh, back when I was 18. And that kind of sparked, like, the rest of my journey and where I am today. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's been kind of a lifelong thing for me. Um, you know, when it fades in and out, I guess that kind of goes with everybody and, and their passions and not realizing what it's going to turn into until something, you know, really important or crazy happens with it. And so how's the experience been being in the field for you so far? I mean, because, you know, most people, they they say, OK, well, I want to start a podcast and they pick a topic. Right. You know, somebody I'm like, I'm going to talk about cars. And somebody else may say, I'm going to talk about makeup. Um, and there's different encounters and experiences, the way people experience the field. How has it been for you overall working in this field so far? Has it been, would you say it's a, a 10 uh, on a scale of goodness? Is it a 5? Is it 1? How has it been for you, the experience itself? Oh, it's been an 11 for sure. It's been such a rewarding and growing thing for me, you know, especially being I mean, I'm 24. And getting into this back, you know, before I was 18, um, I never realized that, you know, at any point how, how far this would get me in life. I mean, and that's just when it comes to just being, you know, like humble and, and just kind of knowing how to talk to people and just being calm and cool and collective and responsible. It all boils down to the Sasquatch. It's crazy. You wouldn't think that it would stem from that, but it does, you know, because you need to have patience when you go out there looking for them. You need to have respect. You need to be humble. You need to know what you're doing and every step you take means something else, you know. So it, it kind of transpires in life a lot for me. And it's it's gotten me pretty far in life. Um, honestly, like having this podcast, being in cooperation with Todd Standing, all of that stuff is because I am, you know, how I am and who I am because of learning what I learned through the Sasquatch and, and, and studying their behaviors and understanding that they're not going to come out to me in any sort of way if I'm just 
some average guy who doesn't really care too much, you know. And I'm an avid hunter. I'm an avid outdoorsman. I love hiking. I love ice bathing. I love swimming out in the creeks and the streams, you know. And I think it takes somebody who's really connected to nature for them to, to really want to come out to you and to show themselves to you. So if I didn't really have that kind of push right out of high school, I'm, I don't know where I'd be today, you know. So uh, I'm... I'm really thankful for, for that encounter. Or whether it was a good or bad one, it didn't matter. It changed my life for the better. So for anybody out there listening, um, you know, if, if, if you did have a bad encounter with Sasquatch, I, I, I'm sorry that that scared the crap out of you. And I hope you can get back in the woods because that's what the ultimate goal is. Yeah, it's one of those things. Um, I find that well, better yet, I'm not even going to talk that way. I'm going to talk to you like... <laughs> I'm going to tell you like it is. Be mindful of the fact that what we attribute our success to, um, we we attribute worship and adoration to. So just be mindful of that. If you're attributing your success to that encounter and with the Bigfoots, then you are attributing your success to the Bigfoots. And so therefore, the thing that can take it away from you is whatever is associated with the Bigfoots. With that being Correct. said, let's move on to the next thing. Um so walk me through your encounter that you did have what ended up happening you were what 17 18 years old yeah i was 18 um i was up in the adirondacks with my dad uh on a hunting trip for i think the weekend or a long weekend and uh, in the adirondacks um the season starts a little bit earlier than it does uh a little bit southern which is where i'm from in the catskills um so we got to get up there and do some rifle hunting early uh, so it was a little bit earlier on in the year, uh, not as late in the fall as rifle season typically is for us. Uh, so we went up there and we had a camper and everything like that set up. We decided, um, we hunted all day, we took a break, went down into town, got some food, you know, hung out. And then we came back to our spot and, uh, decided to go out for like one last kind of like before nightfall hunt. and. So we, I picked a spot, and he picked a spot about 200 yards away from me. So you know, cover more ground. And I'm, I picked a spot where there was fresh snow on the ground, maybe like an inch or two, not much. And I was kind of like in this circle of like pine trees or hemlock trees. They weren't very big. I mean, there was a couple big ones, but most of them were pretty low. You couldn't really see like underneath of them. And there was fresh deer sign going through there, and it was probably like a you know, 60 by 60 kind of yard opening. So I kind of just sat down or kneeled down uh, along the edge of it to see if something would just pop out, you know, while I was waiting there before, uh, before dark came. And <laughs> about five minutes into me sitting there, all of a sudden I just start hearing these big branches breaking. And it's just on the other side of the clearing. Like it sounded like it was just on the other side of the trees, like right in front of me. And at first I was like, oh, okay, you know, like that must be a bear or a moose or something rubbing on a tree or trying to rip it down. Or maybe it's a, a bear ripping a tree apart, you know, uh, trying to get the grubs out or something. And it just didn't stop. Just bang, smash, crash. And I, I grew up logging. I know what a tree sounds like when it falls down. I know what fresh, like, like live trees sound like when they snap compared to like dead fall. These were like fresh, like crack. And they sounded big too, you know, like you don't get the same snap out of, you know, a two inch tree as you would like an eight inch tree. So I'm hearing like eight inch trees just being snapped and ripped apart. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's that. I don't know what that is, but it sounds like it's coming like at me. So I picked up my gun and I pointed it in the direction of where the sound was coming because I was expecting full well a bear to be running through there any second or a big moose or something like that. I don't know. And I'm 18. So it's one of those things that like, there's a thousand things going through my head of like, I'm going to protect myself. And you know, when I, you know, young and dumb. So, uh, and it just kept going. I didn't hear, or I, I didn't see any trees moving. I just, all I heard were these sounds. And like I said, I, I thought they were like right there. And I didn't hear any breathing. You know, if it was like two, mo two moose fighting, you know, you'd hear the antlers hitting, but then you'd hear them grunting and you'd see trees moving and they'd eventually would have broken through somewhere. You would have just known. They make 
they make noise more than just branches breaking. The same with bears, you'll hear growling and all that stuff. It didn't make sense to me how a white tail can make that noise or a person can make that noise or anything like that. So I just think it's something massive over there. And then I just started hearing like whoosh, bang, crash. And I was like, that sounds like leaves going through the air. Like, oh man, I think I know what that is. Because nothing out here can grab a branch or grab a tree and swing it to hit something else except the Sasquatch. So at that point, I probably turned white. Um, and my dad came running over behind me and scared the shit out of me. But, uh, <laughs> and he was white too because he thought like I just got mauled by a bear or something because he heard the tree breaks from you know 200 yards away. For him, it was probably further. It was probably like 250. Um, and in the dense Adirondack wilderness, you know, that's, you know, that just kind of equates for how, how loud those sounds were. And uh, he's like, oh, my God, what's going on? What is it over there? Like, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't really want to know, but it's freaking me out. And it stopped. So we just got the hell out of there. And we left that night, you know, and I never really thought anything of it. Like him and I are really close. Him and I are so close. We talk about everything. My dad is my idol. He's my hero. He's my superman. You know, and uh, that's something we just never talked about. We got back in the camper. We didn't talk about it. We didn't say anything about it. We just talked about whatever else project we had. You know, that we were gonna go finish that week or that weekend or you know, whatever it was gonna end up being. And then uh, later on, and I think it was 2018. Uh, Todd Stanning come out with his documentary um, and I watched it so after I watched it I made that realization I winded it back and then I got my dad and him and I sat down and I watched it for a second time but with my dad and at the end of it I hit pause I looked at him and I said you remember that time in the Adirondacks and I didn't have to say anything more he goes yep I know what you're talking about and yeah I think so too and after that I reached out to Todd and kind of that's how it all went down but yeah that was that was the encounter that uh pretty much set the stone for for what i am and, and what i'm my goal is and so um let's dive a little bit deeper into that encounter um you're there what was the initial feeling that came over you when you started hearing the noise was it fear was it curiosity was it shock was it what was the first the first emotional feeling that you got? There's definitely some sort of like excitement slash you know like uh, adrenaline because you know like I'm hunting and uh, at that point I had only shot like one deer in my life so this is one of those like oh something's moving you know something's coming out here I, I get to see an animal you know so it was that first like adrenaline rush but it was also that weird like that was a little bit loud for a deer you know. And it, it didn't really, it didn't start off slow. It started off just like full tilt into it for the you know, two or three minutes it lasted. I don't know why my mute button won't, won't go off. You know, that's the craziest thing about um, Bigfoot encounters and dogman encounters. It's normally there's residual effects. How did, how did it turn out for you when you got back to safety? Did you, um, how were you able to deal with that over the next 48 hours? Was it nightmares? Was it dreams? Was it, you know, coming to, um, coming to the realization that there's other weird things out there in the woods? How did that play out that following that first 48 hours after the encounter? Well, I think, I don't remember having nightmares or being, you know, traumatized about it or from it. Um, I think it was more of like, uh, okay. I think I know what that was, and I wasn't ever expecting it here type thing, but I, I think it was mostly I just kind of suppressed it for the time being and just kind of moved on with my life. I felt that was probably the best case scenario, so I didn't have trauma or, um, you know, night terrors or anything like that, but it definitely was, it was a paradigm shift for me, you know, because I had known, you know, pretty much walking back that that was something that I did not want to go toe to toe with. You know, regardless if it ended up being something other than a Sasquatch, which I'm 99.9% .9 sure it was not, it still was powerful enough to snap big 
limbs and branches and, and possibly trees. So that was definitely like a, a scary kind of thing for me to realize that there's, there's something out there that my rifle won't harm. And uh, so that was that was a little bit scary. That next 48 hours, I, I definitely wanted to leave because I, I thought it was just sitting and waiting outside the door, you know. No, I can imagine. I would have been scared out of my mind, man, because um, you guys are way out in the middle of nowhere, right? Yeah, so uh, we were outside of um, a little town up there. Um, and we were parked along the side of um, High Peaks National Forest, or I'm sorry, Wild Peaks National Forest. I'm talking about Adirondacks. So it was, I mean, it's a small, small town, and we were out there a, a, a couple miles. Uh, there were other hunters out there in that area, so it wasn't like ridiculously remote, which kind of makes it a little bit more of an interesting encounter that nobody else had seen or heard or. Or, you know, encountered anything out there except for me and my dad. And how does your dad feel about Bigfoot? It was, was it something that he was familiar with? Was it something that he had an encounter with? Or was it just kind of like, uh, son, you know, what the hell was that going on in the woods? Was he familiar with it? Yeah, and you know, he's he watched the Monster Quest shows and everything with me and, you know, the Patterson Giblin film and all that stuff, Finding Bigfoot, you know, and... Uh, it wasn't so much like a reality reality because I mean, he, he grew up in, you know, in the woods logging with my grandfather and he's been out there for thousands of hours and never had any encounters like that. And I know people, you know, who've been hunting for 50, 60 years. I've never heard anything weird in the woods. You know, I've never seen anything. And that may be totally true, you know, until it happens. And my dad was that way. And he, he did believe it wasn't like, um, like a nah, you know, they're, it's all it's just one guy in a monkey suit you know like he, he there was some belief and you know legitimacy that he thought of and um but once we had that encounter i think that kind of really locked it in for him wow that's crazy um and so how does he feel about you know you being active in the bigfoot field and community um i know my dad doesn't give a damn <laughs> he'd be like yo what you doing it's like yo whatever son you know what i'm saying but i don't know how does your dad feel about you being active oh he uh he's super proud he um he's definitely one of the guys who <laughs> you know like if i'm on a show with somebody or if i get to meet somebody new and, and that he knows of because he doesn't know everybody he's not like that involved with it i'm like hey i just smell so and so and i like it's it's my it's my goal to text him something once a day or you know once a week like hey i get to have you know so and so on my podcast and then i just i know that makes him proud that i'm i'm out here doing something that i'm passionate about mm -hmm. and he watches my podcast when i when i put him up or when todd puts him up he's one of the first viewers uh, so it's uh it's really cool to have him you know like right there and, and kind of helping me through because you know I, I do kind of contact them like hey you know like I kind of want to reach out to this person or what do you think I should ask this guy you know and it's like I take a lot of advice from him and uh, it's cool I, I can imagine on his part to see you know the things that he helped me with come out on a podcast and actually go out there and, and seeing me on it and getting you know thousands of views is, is really cool for him so but yeah no he's definitely proud no, that's an awesome thing, man. Um, I talk to a lot of people in the field, and you'll be amazed at how uh, some people's families shun them for what they're doing, and some people's family are embarrassed, which is kind of crazy to me, but um, I can see somebody being neutral, like, ah, whatever, that's he doing that weirdo stuff, right? But then yeah. for people's family to shun them, and they're wildly successful, it's like, uh, bro, you guys need to go ahead and get in some prayer into your family, because that's not cool, that's not how it works. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to dig too deep into your business. Now, you know one thing we didn't do, and I'd rather do it now than do it at the end, tell everybody where they can find your podcast, um, the official name of it, and what avenues that they can listen to it on. Um, I want to say that now, and then we'll circle back and say it at the end as well. All right. Yeah, so um, I'm on YouTube right now um and, and strictly youtube i'm working through some stuff to get in on in and on to spotify um and all those other podcast networks and channels um but right now i'm on sylvanic bigfoot and it's called the discovering bigfoot podcast so if you just go on youtube and, and search discovering bigfoot podcast you'll see me come up with my flag in the background and i'm talking to um todd standing 
uh, his family. Um, also, our expeditioners that come out with us are, are regular expeditioners, people who are part of the cooperation, their encounters, you know, what they think of Todd's films. And I got other people coming on. I had um, a couple really, really awesome people who are, are pretty widely known in the, um, you know, in the Bigfoot community come on, which was super uh, humbling, honestly, for me. And I, you know, I never thought I'd get on. I mean, it's uh, it's something that I'm really proud of. So please go check it out. I have, I think, 15 episodes up right now. Um, and I, like I said, I'm working on Spotify. So Spotify is a big goal for me. And uh, if I can get out on there, then, then it'll be there. <laughs> it'll be called the same thing, Discovering Bigfoot Podcast. I'm hoping it's going to stay the same all the way around. So we'll see. No, nah, that's awesome, bro. You know, um, I'm not much of a Bigfoot, um, like a Bigfooter. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I kind of dibble and dabble in Bigfoot stories. I used to get a lot of them. I kind of decided to focus on Dog Man as opposed to Bigfoot. I felt like um, it was easy for me to be more knowledgeable on one thing, really very, very specific knowledge on one thing, as opposed to trying to broaden that knowledge out. Um, so I'm gonna run some questions by you. You've been out in the field, I know, because you, you reference it out. You've been out in the field actually investigating as well, right? Not just oh, yeah. your first encounter. Um, yeah, no. So let me ask you this: from your experience, what the hell are the lights that people see in the woods at night um, when they're um, when there's Bigfoot activity around, like the orbs of light? What are they? So. I'll be honest with you about that kind of stuff. I was never really trying to talk about it for a while. And it wasn't so much that I didn't believe it. It was more so that, you know, like I'm studying Sasquatch and I need the, you know, hard physical evidence, you know, the footprints, the tree breaks, the footage. That's the stuff that I need now. That other stuff with the UFOs that can wait. So what I did with the orbs is I kind of shelved that. And it wasn't so much that it was going to stay there forever. It was just like, a, I can't, I can't put a door on a car that I don't own, you know? So it's one of those things like, I can't put that piece in the puzzle when I have n no idea on how the puzzle even is supposed to look. So it's one of those things, um, you know, with the orbs, I didn't, I've never seen one and uh, I've never had any encounters or experiences with them. I know people who have, and I just kind of shelved it for the time being. And then I went out with my dad again in the same spot that we had our first encounter. Mm -hmm. And he woke up in the middle of the night and saw a red orb. My dad doesn't lie about stuff like that. So it was like, okay, now it's coming off the shelf. Now, because, <laughs> now, now we got to figure out what's going on. Right. Huh? My dad had, my dad saw one. That's important. That's, you know, they're real 100%. I have no idea really other than that what they are, what they're made of, what they are, what they are trying to show, what they mean. I don't know, honestly. Um, I think the only opinion I could come up with for the orbs would be some sort of energy ball where like high output energy just kind of collects together and forms said, you know, orb. And it just radiates light and energy. I don't think it is really anything more or maybe less than that. But I can't say. I haven't seen one. I haven't been able to study them. I have pictures of orbs uh, people have sent me. And they're incredible. Incredible pictures. But I just, I can't put any opinion on it without seeing one. You know, like I don't feel it's right of me. So um, as for the lights in the woods, um, you know, that kind of goes in with the hand in hand thing, uh, when it comes to, you know, UFOs and, and Sasquatch encounters. Um, and like I said, I, I've never had a UFO encounter out in British Columbia, then looked over and seen a Sasquatch or vice versa. Um, so it's one of those things that I can't really comment on. I'd love to give, you know, this amazing answer for you, but I, I just can't. No, it's all good. You know, I tell you again, it, it's kind of weird to me and it's not this is not attributed to you it's just kind of weird to me in general that you know there was this dividing line across the board in the cryptic community where it's like people only wanted to talk about footprints hair samples 
um, tree breaks and all these different things. But then they ignored, ignored all these ancillary side things that would happen to witnesses. Um, and as I started talking to like really, really large field researchers that were part of BFRO and all the rest of these organizations, they were like, well, you know, we don't get into those kind of weird, they call them supernatural things, the weird supernatural things that occur along with it. And the last gentleman I had a conversation with in private, I said, well, bro, I'm going to keep it 100% real with you. You have ample video of Sasquatch. You have ample footprints of Sasquatch. I mean, castings of Sasquatch. You've had ample hair samples that have been analyzed. I said, you guys have beat that horse until it's dead. So what else is there for you to talk about other than the other weird, strange stuff that's going on? And I told him, I said, just your organization alone, man, you have thousands of reports. And I went to, okay, if we have 10 eyewitnesses that see a murder on a... What the hell was that? If we have 10 eyewitnesses that see a murder on a street corner and all the eyewitnesses describe the same murderer can we come to the conclusion that that murderer exists and he was like yeah and that the murder happened yeah i said so to me it's kind of like where does this field go is where i'm getting the question i'm asking because when i don't see like there being a lack of evidence anymore you know there's with the invention of tiktok and just the sheer amount of bigfoot evidence that's just everywhere I don't know where it goes. So I guess the question is, where do you think this field goes at this point in time? Or is it going to just stay stagnated where people are like, oh, I'm in a field researching. I'm looking at tree breaks. I'm looking at, um, I'm, I'm taking castings of footprints. Where do, where do we go with this at this point in time? Am I making sense? No, you are. Um, and I think we've been trying to push for that for the past, you know, 30 years, 40 years. I mean, ever since Patterson Goodman footage came out, we've been trying to get to that, you know, like, hard evidence and um you know and there is hard evidence out there you know there's the tree breaks there's the footprints there's the footage you know like there's legitimacy behind all of that um but when it comes to where do we go next um we need to have them or one of them walk out of the woods and that's that's the ultimate goal of mine is to basically hand a sasquatch an apple I'm not out there for footage, and I've made that known. I've told other people that on live shows. My goal is to not get footage. Look at Todd Standing. He's the most controversial controversial person in the Bigfoot community and probably will be for, for a long time because of his footage. You know, and it's one of those things that 100% they're real, you know, and I'll, I'll stand behind his footage all day um, and I'll argue points of, you know, of validity of his footage all day. You know, I know that troop. I know those Sasquatch. Uh, I, I habituate with those and uh, those individuals. It's, it's Footage is already out there. We have that footage already. It's not the footage that I'm after. I want to hand one an apple. And, and if that's what it's going to take to have some sort of person out there who's big enough in, you know, like let's say Joe Rogan comes out with me. Right. And I get to the point where I can reach my hand out with an apple in it and a Sasquatch walks out and takes an apple out of my hand. Do you think the discovery of Bigfoot will be done then? Or who the fuck else am I going to have to show a Sasquatch to in order to get this done? Do I have to take the president of the United States out? It doesn't. It almost doesn't really matter. Um, it, it depends on who they're willing to come out for. Um, and, and, and who they're willing to show themselves to. Because, you know, and if they show themselves to the right person, that's what it's going to be. Uh, and I feel like I'm kind of in that spot where I'm, I'm driving and I'm pushing that goal. And I hope it does happen. And it, it doesn't even have, like, if, that, if somebody else does that, I'm, I'd be so happy. I don't have to fly to Canada again. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things. That it's, it's not like a personal um you know, like vendetta for me to do it. It has to be me. It's not that. It's like somebody needs to show the right person a Sasquatch and it has to be a legitimate encounter where one, you know, walks right out. Here I am, takes a bite out of an apple, throws it back at him and walks away. You know, and guess what? I left a footprint for you. You know, you got three cameras up, whatever. It didn't matter. That's what needs to happen. There's no other way for this to happen. I, I am totally against killing one for proof. I think that's totally unnecessary. All we have to do is communicate with them. 
and and let them understand that this is if you want species protection and you want to keep your habitat and you want to stop the logging and the deforestation in, in your habitats and in your your territories then you need to to just take the risk and step out for the right person um so that manifestation is is just as big as you know anything else going on in, in the sasquatch community and you can sit there and look at your brakes all day and you, you can justify the footprints all day but until one walks out in front of you you're not going to believe it yeah well i think the masses of people are not going to believe it I, I i was saying this to um to d Dawes the other day we were talking about bigfoot and he was talking about going back into the field and i was like bro i really don't care about the evidence anymore because i've seen ample amounts of evidence that people have had and to me it seems like in order for people to believe that this exists and i and out um and for that belief to like break through the walls and barriers of the existing context of humanity right now bigfoot would have to walk down um uh like bourbon street in new orleans right whacking off um eating on a leg of a deer and spitting DNA all over the place in order for people to believe it. Um, because those who believe that it exists, they believe it exists. But those who believe it exists get bogged down into um, the fighting and stabbing and cutting of my evidence is better than yours, your evidence is fake, my evidence is real, yours is this. It gets bogged down into this foolishness that when anyone from the outside looks in, like legit, anybody who has like a person who's like, oh, I never thought about. It. I think I might have saw a Bigfoot. Let me go look and see what's going on. It's like you open these gigantic doors, and it's just mayhem inside the doors. Like remember that movie? Um, there was a movie where uh, I think it was The Kingsman, where they had the church scene, and the guy turned on the radio frequency, and it was inside the church, and everybody was killing each other, stabbing each other. It's like The Kingsman inside the community it's like you outside the church oh man i'm gonna go find out the truth you open up the door people stabbing each other shooting each other hitting each other with bibles it's crazy that's going on until in my opinion until all of that calms down um across the board and maybe we standardize some things and i say we i don't know if i even consider myself a part of the bigfoot community and if i want to be but it like there has to be some kind of standardization across the board, some kind of overarching goal for everyone in the community that people can get behind and defend jointly a piece of evidence or defend jointly something that will be definitive that everybody will hold the line like the 300 at the hot gates being attacked by the Persians. And I, I just don't see it happening. Um, I always see people breaking off and running off in their own direction, which it only hurts the field as a whole, man. It, it's, it's kind of sad for me to look at it and I've seen it just from the outside looking in. Um, for example, I, before carry on pass, man, Carrie sent me some pictures and some video. I was like, yo bro, this is Bigfoot hands down. That's Bigfoot on camera, on video. That's crazy. <laughs> um, and even that stuff, phenomenal evidence was just attacked. It is it, to me, it was just disheartening. So, I mean, maybe if you can get a Bigfoot to walk out into the middle of the highway in front of the president of the United States, and I, I seriously doubt that the president of the United States does not know that this exists already, um, you'd be able to accomplish a goal or uh, whatever the overarching goal is. But to me, it's to me, it's mass confusion, man. It really, really is. That's why for this month, for Bigfoot month, I'm just bringing a whole bunch of people in. Some of these people are not gonna like each other. They're gonna talk shit to each other. It's gonna be yeah. it's gonna be a madhouse when I get through with this. But we're going to all come together and we're going to all talk about Bigfoot. And people going to be like, you this, you know, I'm like, shut the hell up. We're talking about Bigfoot. I don't care how you feel about the person. Let's talk about Bigfoot. Because right. until that happens, bro, um, I just don't see how we can, how not we, how any group of people can convince an outside entity or group of people that something exists, that something's relevant, that something, whether it's a threat or you believe it's your friend, how do you convince any other group of people when you're in such disarray, you know, and I yeah, think I just so, got on, I just passed out like I told you I would. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. The, the best way I could answer that would be if you're going to get into it and you're going to want to stand behind somebody, find somebody that you truly believe and that you, you, you know is a humble person, and you know, is out there for the best of intentions of the discovery. 
you know, I, that's, in my opinion, that's me, you know, that's Todd. Um, it's just one of those things that, you know, when you spend enough time out there, you, you become, you know, a, a certain person in order to, to survive and to adapt and to have them come out and, and show themselves to you. Uh, you have to be a certain person to that. And, uh, man, you, you can't go out there with a bad attitude. You can't go out there with a, I'm going to catch, you know, you can't be sneaky about it. They're, they already are four steps ahead of you. You know, why do you think we haven't got the best proof? Because they're smarter than you. Sorry. We're the, we're the, we're the masters of civilization. They're the masters of the wilderness. You know, the, you walk into their backyard, they know every stick, every rock, every tree. They know every bird, every noise. It doesn't matter what technology you may or may not have. They're going to outdo you. They're going to win. There's no way around it. So going in there with, you know, $50,000 worth of equipment and 10 guys, it's not going to get you anywhere. Sorry, finding Bigfoot. But you got to go out there with one or two people and you put the cameras down and you go out and enjoy nature. And that's the way you find Sasquatch. And if, and if you're somebody who's new to it and who wants to find your people in, involved in this whole thing, you got to do a little bit of research. You got to figure out who you like. You got to figure out who you trust and uh, stick with that. You know, most of the time they won't be sellouts. Most of the time they won't go and, and collab with people who are sketchy and, and, you know, work for snake oil productions as, you know, I don't want to get into it. But if, if you know anything about it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, just find the people that you think are the most honest, the most trustworthy, the most humble. And uh, and the best of intentions, and that's who you stick with. Yeah, well, I, I don't know anything about. So, for example, I don't, I don't keep, I don't track Bigfoot. I don't know who you talk about with Snake Oil Productions. I know earlier in the conversation, you caught me aback when you was like, "Well, you can ask me any tough question," and I'm like, "I don't know why the fuck I would you be asking you a tough question when we're having a conversation." Like, I don't keep <laughs> up with. Honestly, bro, I don't. I don't keep up with the drama of like differences of opinions and people's beefs unless they include me in it into the issues because I'm, I'm just born and raised in New Orleans, bro. Like you mind your business until somebody make right. it your business, then it becomes your business. And I like talking to people and I want to hear from everybody's perspective, what's going on. And to me, it's been, that's been an overarching problem um, that I've experienced since I've come into this. It's like, if you, I don't like people telling me you can't talk to a person because they feel this way about a person or you can't talk to that person because I feel this way about that person. And that's, um, that's one of those things that down here where I'm from will get a bullet in your head because you're inheriting somebody else's beef. You know, you call yourself being upset because this person and that person had an issue. Man, that's their freaking issue. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. That's between yeah. them. Now, if you make me your issue, then fine, I'll be your issue. But outside of that, man, I just, I just don't, I, I don't do it. You know what I'm saying? It, it's childish, it's retarded to me. Um, and it's, it's just yeah, it's yeah. backwards. And I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you 100. percent I think it's childish and stupid and ridiculous, and we should be able to come to just one, you know, one. Just let's just be one group. Let's like, how hard is it in a perfect world to just all agree on one thing, or, or how about two things? Sasquatch is real, and whatever else decides to to become that second question. But even then, you know, that, like. I, I do talk a little bit of shit, but that's because I talk shit on the people who are only out there for the money and they did nothing for the discovery. If you're going to have a Bigfoot show or you're going to be Bigfoot this or Bigfoot that, you better be in it for the best of reasons and the best of intentions. I don't want to see a guy who, you know, is in his 60s, who, who has been a logger his whole life or, you know, who, I, you know, somebody who goes out there and then like, cuts down wildernesses and uh and is all about bigfoot like no you're kind of not because uh you you destroyed their their forest for 50 years you know uh it it doesn't matter (laughs) it does it shouldn't matter what your opinion is or what i think of that person you know it it just needs to be for the right reasons you know it's just it's hard for me to kind of describe it because i have so many mixed feelings about it when it comes yeah. down to, to all that and i i'm yeah i'm trying not to talk shit <laughs> well i'm a, i'm a, well let me let me play the devil's advocate to that because right. in this community i've heard that that talking point before right 
it's and I don't I, you help me understand this from your mindset because there's a group of people I would love to have this conversation with but they won't have this conversation with me like there's there's this overarching theme in the Bigfoot community that it's that someone else can judge someone's participation in in a field um so for example someone who's in the field and let's say they're in it and they're making money in the field for some reason that makes them unauthentic in the field i don't understand where this thing about monetization makes somebody not be um monetization equates to something negative in this field this is the only field that i've ever been in kyle that i've worked in where it's anti-monetization where you need monetization to actually prove what you're talking about is real so how, how did that how did that come about how does that mindset work because it doesn't make any sense to me i've had people say that you know dark waters is all about the money and he's all about this but dark waters had i've had a camera project that captured evidence in the woods with live cameras that cost money um i've funded field researchers to go out in the field that people don't know about i funded podcasts for people that they don't still don't know is attached to me how does that where does that mindset come from like just i don't even i don't I don't understand help me understand that because it's kind of like it's in this it's a bucket and it's within this certain context that if you are in this bucket over here then you're bad you see what i'm saying and i, I just don't understand right. that yeah i think the majority of the people out there who are, are kind of in that mindset you know like if, if you're in it for the money and you're, you're making money off of it you're only in it for the money and you're not doing anything towards the actual goal of, of the discovery um and you know there's a couple big shows out there who you know spent four hundred thousand dollars per episode where'd that money go it didn't it didn't go to jeff meldrum's research it didn't go to you know melba ketchum's dna you excuse know, me stuff so if you're going to make a lot of money off of this subject and you're going to be knowledgeable in this subject and you're going to want to make this discovery happen you're going to take that money and yes you do have to make a living obviously you got bills to pay your time is worth money my podcast i'm probably going to get paid for my podcast and that's great because i spend i have equipment that i spent money on i have my time that i'm spending doing this doing these shows with people and and reaching out to people and emails there's a lot involved in it my time's worth money uh, uh, yeah a hundred percent. So, so is I'm it the amount people. of money that we're talking about? I, I think there is a line there. Yeah, I think. Yeah, because listen to what you're saying to me, bro. You're yeah. saying, you're saying you're guilty of the same thing other people are guilty of, unless you're taking your dollars that you're making from your podcast and right. dumping them into Meldrum and Kitchens and all this other. It's the same thing. And I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm just, I'm legit trying to figure this mindset out. Of how this works, because when I tell you this is confusing for somebody who's from New Orleans, who used to be a dope boy, I just, I just, it just baffles me. Yeah. The mindset baffles me because at the end of the day, there's, in my opinion, there's two things that happen in every field. For example, when I worked as an electrical engineer, there was an expectation that I went to work as an electrical engineer. I was in the woods, way in the middle of Arkansas. Um, designing transmission lines, there was an expectation that there was compensation for that work. And nobody begrudged the compensation for that work in any way, shape, or form. It seems as if the larger people in the Bigfoot community, the bigger that name is, there's this begrudging for the compensation, But and that's fine, but then there's this, nobody wants to rise to that level and fight the battle to get up that ladder to where okay, not only do they have the compensation that person has, but now they have the microphone and megaphone that they have to actually speak up from their perspective. It's kind of like you got to get to the top of the mountain in order to change the narrative. Do I agree that like a TV show that has people in the woods knocking on trees is completely and totally ridiculous? Everybody knows that's ridiculous, right? But so who from the community is going to go out there and go to that top of that mountain and do something different it's like I just see people talking about those people, but nobody's rising to the occasion and say, hey, let's change the narrative of what these people saying. Because think about it. All together, bro, in this community, there's enough listeners, watchers, followers, um, content creators to where, man, you could shift that narrative in a heartbeat. 
but it's almost like it's easier for people to talk about it than do something about it and that's that's what confuses me and it throws me off bro I'm, and I'm, honestly it does Kyle it throws me off because I'm sitting there looking at the problem saying okay yeah you guys are right these guys do some wild stupid shit and okay well who gonna go up there and fix it and then nobody's up there to fix it so but it's like the focus is on that thing anyway again am I making sense to you bro yeah, you are, you know, and, th- and there's a thing there too, where if you're going to be a big production company and you're going to put something out there that is legit, there has to be some sort of entertainment value for them. They're not going to put out a legitimate scientific show that is on a comedy channel, you know, like these, these big enterprises or whoever that put these shows out, they force feed other shit in there so that it becomes entertainment. And once it becomes entertainment, it's no longer legitimate, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. My the stuff that I do is not for entertainment; it's for the discovery. It's to okay, am I going to learn a lesson from this? Is this going to change anything? Am I going to get better results from this? Uh, you know, like are they going to throw a rock at me? Are they going to kill me? Like, what are they going to do? Those are the the changes that I make because I don't have a TV show, you know, following me around. It makes a difference, yeah, but it also doesn't make a difference at the same time because they're not going to put out the truth. They're not going to want to, oh, okay, well, he's he's going to stand there for 10 minutes and stare at this broken tree. That's not entertaining to people who they're aiming for. So they, they have to, to make it kind of stupid in order for people to want to come on and watch. And that's where that line is where it's okay to, to get paid for the time you're putting in and, and the research that you're doing for the right reasons versus – Oh, it's just a stupid show to put on for background noise because there's nothing legitimate to it. Right. So I, I get what you're saying. So this is a, it's an, it's an issue of purity as it pertains to the topic because there, and this is just my business mind talking. Um, I, I've funded field researchers, right? And I've done live field research projects where we live, where people live on camera and we're watching it. And it would be, the guy could be there for 20, 30 minutes and nothing happened. So the real that the reality of field research from what I've seen and what I've invested in is there's times when some of my guys have been out there and they've been three days and they didn't have anything, right? right. So yep. I don't understand there has to be a better balance, and this is just my opinion, between the purest nature of what people perceive as the Bigfoot researcher community and the ability to monetize it to the point to where you can get your message out. Not me, you guys can get your message out. So, um, and there, no production house is going to do that. It's going to have to be an in-house production thing from the community itself that rises to compete with that. But and even in doing did. that, but even in doing that, you can't be a purist because you being a purist, you'll never reach you'll never reach the masses of people that will and hold their attention. It, it, unless, because think about it, you've been out in the woods, you've seen Bigfoot. You know, out the corner of your eye or head on. How long does does that encounter last when you see them? How many seconds? Is it a five minute encounter, sixty second encounter? It's usually less than a minute. Okay, so you may, and how many yeah, hours would you say you were out there for that less than a minute encounter? I spent two weeks out there for forty five seconds of an encounter. Okay, how the hell do you relay that to the masses that you were in the exactly. woods for two weeks for forty five seconds without? Um, without adding something into it, without adding other people to it, without adding. So the the issue is, if you want to if you want to get the truth out, that truth is that forty five seconds is the truth. That's the truth, right? Everything prior to that forty five seconds, bro. Those two weeks, bro. You can't expect them to sit there and watch through two weeks. So, but the exactly. truth is, this is what we saw. This is what we got on camera. And that's and this is just me, Kyle. This is where I think people mess up. They confuse the moment of truth with the process of getting to the truth. There's a moment of truth, but there's a process that it takes to get there. And I just I just wish that people in the community would understand that. So with that formula, you guys, and I mean, because I don't really care to do it. I don't even care to go through the, the crap that it takes to, to create it. You guys can actually say, okay, this is the moment of truth. I was there. We had this on camera. You know, we got this in video. Now, the rest of this stuff, we have to find a way to make that entertaining. I'm not saying fake it. I'm not saying sit there and throw rocks at yourself. But what I'm saying is, man, how do I take me sitting in the woods scratching my balls for two weeks and make it entertaining? It may be 
talking about your life. It may be talking about your family. It may be something, but bro, that's the only way it's going to work. And I think so much of the contention and confusion in this community comes from that mindset of real versus like kind of like real researcher versus, you know, the entertainment side. But they they are both in order for you to get what you want. They both have to meld together. One is the hammer. One's the nail. And if you don't understand that, then you run somebody running around with a hammer and somebody running around with a nail and nobody's doing any construction. You know what I'm saying? Just keep it real with you, bro. And it is, it's, it's just insane to me. And when I tell you I've been through this, I've had people saying, oh, you're all about the money. You're all about this. You're all about. And I'm like, yo, y'all freaking retarded. Like, I've never seen anything like that. Like, ever. I mean, ever seen that mindset outside of this community. I mean, even on my other YouTube channels that I run, I have a dog channel. Bro, there's no problem with monetization in the world of dogs. There's nothing whatsoever. It's like people, oh, yeah, you got a got a dog collar. Yeah, we'll take that dog collar. I love it. It's only in this field. And I, I just, it's a mindset. And it's a mindset that leads to so much strife and fighting and arguing that it, it, it just doesn't, it makes no fucking sense to me. Part of my language. Is I think one of the things, too, is there's nothing to sell. What, what like, I don't have a dog collar to sell to you. I don't have a, a, a dog collar to review for you. I have my experience, and here's some footage of it. That's it. Technically. You go on YouTube, you look up a Bigfoot video, you find one, you watch it, do you buy anything? No. You strictly were there just to see for yourself. You do have something to sell, too. though. You are what you're selling. You're the product. Just like you and I talking, what is your podcast? Your podcast is you. You're selling the product of you, your beliefs, your ideas, your thought process. You're what's for sale. And I think that's the problem that people don't get. You're selling people on you, your belief, your belief system, the way you think, the way you, and that's what people, you're, everything people do on YouTube is, even, for example, let's take one of my favorite guys, like uh, uh, Salty Cracker. I love Salty Cracker, right? He'd be like, re go crazy. Is he selling conservative news or is he selling himself? He's selling his Salty Cracker personality. Him screaming, looking like he on cocaine all the time. Going ape bananas crazy. I'm sold on him. Not necessarily what he's talking about. You know what I'm saying? Then for me being sold on his personality, next thing you know, I might buy a salty cracker mug and drink out of the mug. But it's it's, it's just like, yeah, you do have something to sell. And what you're selling is yourself. And I think people confuse that with somebody profiting off of Bigfoot or profiting off of a cryptid. It's like, no, you're selling who you are. You're selling a piece of you to the world. And the people are buying into you. I mean, they're not buying into Bigfoot. They're buying into you. How you present it. How you how you how you lay it out. So I, I don't know, bro. It's just no. You're right. You're. On, I didn't look at it like that. So thank you for that. No, it, it just it just. I'm sorry. It just it just gets under my skin because to me it's like business 101, marketing 101. Um, and when you look at the overarching problem, it really is a very simple solution. It's a mindset. And as that mindset, it's, it's like there's this governor put on this engine. And people impose that governor on themselves. Because it's, if you're in this lane, then you can't do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Are you considered to be this? And then if you're in this lane, like I've talked to the people who do TV shows. And they look down on researchers. And I'm like, yo, what you mean? Like this guy's out in the woods with ticks crawling all on him, getting sick. Um you know in the hospital and he's getting real footage but they don't they don't see it that way they see it as oh that's a foolish person out in the woods as a producer they's like oh that's foolish you know because he doesn't have anything that could be monetized no he got a whole bunch that could be monetized you just don't want to monetize it the way you want to do it and it, it's just i don't know bro i've had these conversations and spazzed out on both sides it's just and it's a real simple solution to the problem we as a community have enough power Bigfoot, dog man, whatever, to outdo any production house. The legit any production house. But as a community, the mindset, and I'll say we, the mindsets have to change that will allow the support of one person to rise. And, and, and it, you might not even like that person that rises, but the mindset has to change to allow that one person to rise up to the top, and that one person has to agree once they kick the door in. The hordes are going to flood in before the doors doors close, and then boom, you got the whole thing.
but it's just I don't know, bro. Anyway, all right. Anyway, let me get off my my freaking horse and let's go into something else. All right. Um. So we talked about your research. We talked about your dream of handing one an apple. So let's go to this moment because I want to know how you're gonna deal with this. So you standing there. Imagine yourself standing there. You got a giant. What color apple? What color apple you want to be? A red or a green apple? Which one you get? Red. With? So you got a big old red apple in your hand. A eight, nine foot tall hairy monster walking from behind a tree and grabs the apple and grabs your hand at the same time looking you in your eyes, man. What is that going to do to you for the rest of your life? Well, uh, firstly, just just to kind of paint the picture a little bit better. I would, <laughs> All right, repaint I would it. Go ahead, repaint it, repaint it. Okay. Uh, I'd, I'd probably just be sitting down or, or like on uh, on one knee because I just I don't want to. There's an intimidation factor, um, obviously, with them, and like if you make eye contact, they're gonna you're gonna rip you apart. So you just don't do that. Um, so yeah, it's pretty much I'm just I'm just gonna be hopefully kneeling down or sitting down and just not looking at it, but knowing it's there because I see its feet and I, I hear it, feel it breathing, and I just feel the apple come out of my hand. I, I think that's enough for me yeah, to be okay. That's my goal just happened. Nah, um, Kyle, come on, man. Now like, we can't go. Nah, come on, bro. You gotta, you gotta, I dude. It, it's <laughs> not a matter of like, oh, you could have looked at. No, it's it's life and death right there, dude. Yeah, there's a nine foot tall Sasquatch standing a foot away from you, and there's probably three other of them, you know, in the wood line with one with a rock, one with a branch, one with who knows what else, and they're just arm back ready to to let that thing go on me it's like if i do anything wrong in that situation nobody's ever going to see me again there is a mutual respect boundary what you need to take when you're in a situation like that and the last sighting i had i was on my knees dude and this thing was 15 feet away from me and i i barely i just glanced up at it to see it was there you don't make eye contact would you want to go to a zoo and get it in the in the cage with a gorilla and then try to stare it down in the eyes? It's gonna rip you to shreds. You don't do that. I'm with you. I'm just saying. I'm all I'm saying is this, homie. You went. You were out there for four weeks. The Bigfoot finally came, and you're not gonna get a good look at it. That's all I'm saying. I I'm with you. I know you'll get yourself torn into pieces. That's why I don't go out in the woods looking for him because I'm retarded. Because I'm gonna be <laughs> like. I'm not kneeling. I won't look at you. I'm out here. I won't yeah. see you. And it's going to be a problem. I'll probably get torn in the shreds, but that's why I don't do that. Um, I, I just couldn't do it. But I hope that you get to encounter and experience what you want to experience because you really are a person talking to you, man. You really have a love and a passion for this. Um, and it shines through in the conversation. It really, really does. More than a lot of people that I've spoken to. Uh, it really does shine through. And I hope that you, I hope that you have the encounter, the one that you want. I hope you don't get ripped in the shreds, and I hope they don't like spear you with a tree limb or nothing like that. You just get up and get out of here safely. But uh, I would love to hear about that encounter, man. And we're running out of time, so tell everybody where they can find you again and how they can um, see your videos and see your podcast. All right, yeah. So, like I said before, I'm on Sylvanic Bigfoot on YouTube. Um, I got hundred thousand subs on that YouTube channel, uh, and the show is called Discovering Bigfoot Podcast. If you want to reach out to me, I'm on Gmail. It's Discovering Bigfoot Podcast at gmail.com. That easy. Hit me up on Messenger. I'm on the Facebook uh, Discovering Bigfoot um, fan page. I'm an admin on that. I'm on the live streams all the time with Todd. So it's it's pretty easy to get a hold of me if you want to. And, uh, you know, you can also comment below the, the videos. And hopefully we'll be out there on Spotify soon. Man, keep on plugging, Kyle. Keep on doing your thing. You're a good dude. I mean, you even talking to you, and y'all talk to a lot of people, and you can get a bad feeling about people. You're a good dude. Keep on plugging, man. Keep on making it happen. And I look forward to uh, to hearing that story of you giving them that apple, man. Yeah, I can't wait to say it. Yeah, I look forward to it. I want to know what happens uh, afterwards, how you get the hell out of that situation. But <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how you get out of that. All right, brother. It was great talking to you, man, and I appreciate you spending some time with me. Hey, reach out anytime. It's good to hear from you. All right, man. Awesome sauce.